So today's topic is a uh, preview of uh, what's coming down the road with ZOS Communication Server. Specifically, uh, we're going to basically preview the content uh, for ZOS V2R3 from a communication server perspective. Uh, the charts that we will be using um, are have been posted, uh, as you can see here on the link in SlideShare. So if you want to be able to access those charts, right, you can use that link to get to that. So. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Gus Kassimis. I'm the lead architect for, for ComServer, also joined by Sam Reynolds, uh, who is also an architect for, for uh, Communication Server. And we're going to basically kind of tag team through this presentation. So uh, getting started, uh, if we look at the agenda, there's, uh, as you can see here, we have a lot of interesting, good topics that we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to start off with the ZOS encryption readiness technology, a new technology that uh, I'll be walking you through in, 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 in a bit of detail. Uh, and then follow that up, uh, we're going to switch over and Sam Reynolds is going to take us through a variety of topics that touch upon a lot of different technologies, uh, get an update on where we are with mail and where he we're headed with mail, uh, and then additional uh, key functions in, in ZOS V2R3. We're also going to try to give you an update on where we are with the Configuration Assistant. Uh, and in the appendix, there's other uh, topics that we're not going to have time to cover in this call, but once you have access to the charts, you can also take a look at. Okay, so uh, moving along, um, our standard disclaimer here. So uh, with V2R3, in case you haven't seen it yet, right, maybe about two, three weeks ago, we had our preview announced. So there was an announcement that previewed uh, the content of ZOS V2R3 in general, including uh, communication server content. Uh, so this is a this was a, a preview announcement. So uh, between now and you know general availability, uh, obviously there could be some changes. Uh, a lot of what we'll be talking about here, you know, I think we are we're fairly uh, uh, far down the road where we don't expect major changes, but uh, uh, it, it is our responsibility to just let you know of that. Okay, so the first topic we're going to talk about is ZOS Encryption Readiness Technology, or um, ZERT for short. Uh, it's a pretty long name, so we like the acronym ZERT to, to refer to this. And I'm going to set the stage with uh, what is this function really about? Uh, so uh, the, the focus area here is encrypting network traffic, and the fact that encrypting network traffic is becoming uh, a standard practice even within trusted networks, right? I think for most of you, uh, you'll say, um, I'm, I'm doing some level of network encryption today, um, but uh, uh, per perhaps the, the pendulum is swinging where, the, you know, there, there used to be communications within, let's say, the data center within a segment of the network that was considered trusted, where previously perhaps some of that traffic was not encrypted. Uh, what we're finding is that um, in, uh, encryption and network traffic is pretty much becoming a uh, key part of the strategy for comprehensive data protection, right? So this is really about a larger effort about making sure that all data is encrypted and protected, right, from unauthorized users, uh, whether potentially it's on, it's on disk, uh, whether it's uh, in flight in any means, but certainly from a network perspective, uh, anytime data is being transmitted in and out of the uh, 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 servers. So uh, we, we are seeing that, that trend pick up where pretty much, you know, uh, I, I think where we're headed to is all network traffic at some point, right, that leaves and enters a ZOS system may have some requirements for encryption. So, um, in doing that, what we're finding is that customers, uh, as they're doing their analysis to try to figure out, right, uh, simple questions such as what data is encrypted and what is not, right? Uh, where should encryption occur? Uh, who is responsible, right? So what we mean there is with ZOS systems, there's a lot of different workloads that could be executing within a ZOS system, right? And encryption, as we'll see, uh, there's various technology choices and various administrators that may be involved in these questions, right? And ultimately, you want to be able to um, understand as a business, right, whether your network of traffic, traffic is encrypted or not. And if it is encrypted, is it meeting, 
your enterprise um, security standards, whatever those may be. Some of those may be driven by things like PCI compliance, right? But you may have um, uh, typically your own uh, enterprise uh, standards, right? That you need to, to need to adhere uh, to. So that's the starting point of where of, of, of where we began with this was that we find that this is a difficult task to do today prior to the introduction of this technology in terms of the number of people that it may require, the number of data sources that one needs to examine, be it SMF records, be it logs, be it in some cases packet traces in order to determine uh, what's occurring. And the question is, you know, can we do better? And hopefully once we conclude this topic, you'll see that we're introducing some key functionality that will help uh, help you answer these questions. Okay, so if we take a look at when we talk about network encryption, what is it we're really talking about? There's a lot of different methods for encrypting traffic. The ones that we're going to focus on is the ones that we feel, based on discussions again with customers, are the prevalent mechanisms to protect TCP IP traffic. So uh, the first one we'll talk about is TLS SSL direct usage. So the idea here is using SSL or TLS protocols, but basically um, uh, implemented in a manner that the middleware, right, uh, or subsystems, whatever term you want to use, things like, let's say, WebSphere or MQ or uh, products like Connect Direct, directly invoke services on the platform, right, to basically be able to implement TLS or SSL. And the services that they invoke depend on the execution environment. Uh, many of the native uh, ZOS middleware subsystems will exploit system SSL services, right, uh, directly in order to be able to encrypt their traffic. Uh, others, if you're running in a Java environment, you may be uh, invoking uh, uh, Java class methods uh, under JSSE, uh, the Java Sockets uh, uh, extension, uh, security extension uh, 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 functionality, which underneath the covers performs very similar processing right to what system SSL does. And typically the middleware would do this on a connection basis, right? And it's typically for TCP uh, applications only, right? The TLS and SSL uh, is used on ZOS. So that's one method, right? Uh, another method is to use ATTLS. So with the technology we have within ZOS Communication Server, a network admin can basically set up an ATTLS policy to perform TLS and SSL processing on behalf of an application, right? Uh, so there, it's the network admin that's basically responsible and, and, and so forth. In that environment, you obviously have a centralized policy, so you can get a, a good view of what, what it is you're doing, uh, typically configured through the configuration assistant. And you also have SMF 119 records, uh, specifically the, the uh, TCP connection records, right, uh, subtypes uh, 2, include ATTLS information about what it is that we're, we're covering. And again, it's typically transparent to, to the applications. Underneath the covers, ATTLS exploits system SSL to implement this, right? It's just that we remove the burden on the middleware to, to, uh, uh, to implement this technology directly. Now, another key technology is IPsec and Ike, right? Uh, uh, using virtual private network technology to establish a secure uh, pipe, right, across two, zero, two uh, um, hosts, one of which is ZOS and the other one could be ZOS or any other platform. Uh, and with IPsec, what's interesting is it's a host-to-host -host typically, right, um, connection that your session that you're basically uh, encrypting traffic on. And there, it can really operate on all network traffic or a subset of the traffic that's flowing across hosts can use that same security association. So in that scenario, we do provide you with SMF records, but only about the information about the security association at a high level, right? We don't necessarily tell you what specific network traffic that's coming from and to the host that's protected from that. And then finally, the other key technology that we find users rely on is OpenSSH. Um, so this is the secure shell that's uh, provided by the ZOS OpenSSH that's now integrated into, the, uh, into ZOS. And many of the use cases revolve around SFTP, that's the uh, SSH, provided secure file transfer, uh, not to be confused by our regular FTP that's being provided by, uh, by TCP IP. 
But uh, that also provides for secure terminal access, right? A secure shell to, to, to log on to and issue commands on the mainframe. And also uh, a technology called TCP port forwarding, where with OpenSSH you can establish a tunnel across two OpenSSH hosts and tunnel any other existing traffic, TCP traffic, over that as well. And uh, OpenSSH does provide some amount of uh, auditing through SMF uh, 119 records as well. So various technologies, right, that, that, that could be used, and we know of many customers that use all four of these, right, uh, technologies. Now, continuing with the background, some of the key questions here is, given that you do have multiple mechanisms, multiple configuration methods, multiple administrators, right, because when we're talking about OpenSSH or we're talking about middleware that use system SSL or JSSC, it's typically not the network admin that's, that's, that's setting up those configurations for TLS and SSL. How can you, right, um, answer questions like which traffic is protected and maybe even more importantly, which is not, right, because that might be where your security gaps are. For traffic that is being protected, what security protocol is being used? What is the protocol version? What are the cryptographic algorithms? What are the key lengths for those algorithms? And so on, right? And once you do that, you know, uh, also be able to tell who does the traffic belong to, right? In case you find any exceptions, right, to your enterprise um, security standards, who do I need to go talk to, right? So being able to answer those, those key questions. So uh, this is really what we're really driving at is being able to give you some technology here that will help you answer those questions in a much more efficient manner than what is possible, what is possible today, right? Now, um, once you've answered these questions, right, how do you convey this information to auditors, compliance officers within your company, right, that may be asking you these questions on a periodic basis? Now, uh, the key thing here is we're aiming this at the network uh, administrator, or maybe if you have a more specialized role within your enterprise, the network security administrator, because uh, in discussions with customers, we tend to find that the network administrator is one of the key people that gets asked these questions, whether they're responsible for the network traffic or not, right? Given that we're talking about network encryption, they're usually a focal point in that whole discussion of compliance. So there are many factors that drive these questions, right? Um, again, there could be regulatory compliance. Um, there could be vulnerabilities in protocols and algorithms. So when we talk about what security protocol, what version of the protocol, right? Uh, I'm sure over the past, you know, uh, several years, you might have been involved at times with a vulnerability in some network security protocol. Uh, maybe it's a version of SSL that should no longer be used because it's got issues, right? That you quickly need to assess, right? What's impacted from all your network traffic that's uh, running on the host today. Okay, so that was setting the background, and, and now we're gonna shift focus into what is the ZOS encryption readiness technology about, or ZERT? So we're gonna start with uh, a statement um, that basically kind of summarizes what we, uh, in one sentence, right, what we're trying to achieve with this technology in what you will see in ZOS V2R3. And a lot of what we've been doing in terms of developing the technologies going forward uh, is, is using IBM design thinking practices. You, you probably have been exposed to that, I would think, at some level uh, by now, whether um, uh, you, you were looking for it or not. But with IBM design thinking, the key thing here is that we're really trying to focus everything we do in terms of major function development on the end user, right? And being able to have a dialogue with the end user on what the problem statement is, right? And what the, uh, how we're looking to basically solve that. So I'm just going to read the statement here. Uh, a ZOS network administrator can discover and audit the network encryption attributes associated with ZOS TCP and enterprise extended traffic by analyzing new SMF records. Right, so that's in one sentence, really what we're trying to achieve is give you a new capability, right, that will allow you to basically get a comprehensive view of your TCP and enterprise extended traffic in regards to network encryption attributes and do that by producing, you know, new SMF records that will allow you to do this all using uh, a single set of records. So 
what we're really doing here is positioning TC the TCP IP stack as a central collection point and repository for the cryptographic security attributes for, again, I'm just going to emphasize TCP connections that are protected by TLS, SSL, SSH, IPsec, or are unprotected. Because again, that's a key attribute, right? If uh, identifying traffic that isn't protected by any of these security protocols. Note there that we're saying that regardless of which SSL library, TLS library, you're using, right? Whether you're using HTTLS or you're using system SSL directly or any of that. Now, we also uh, believe that, you know, one of the key uh, workloads uh, that uh, we need to provide you this information for is for Enterprise Extender. And Enterprise Extender, as you all know, is UDP-based, but we're treating it as Enterprise Extender Connections because logically with Enterprise Extender, you do have the notion, right, of a logical connection across Enterprise Extender endpoints. So um, we will be covering Enterprise Extender as well. Now, in terms of any other UDP traffic, non-Enterprise non Extender traffic, uh, in this initial deliverable in V2R3, we will not provide any coverage, right? But we do believe that Enterprise Extender is a very large percentage of UDP traffic that most uh, ZOS customers see. Uh, we will have two methods for discovering the security associations and their attributes. The first one will be through stream ob observation, and we will do that for TLS, SSL, and SSH. And the idea there is TCP IP will seize, seize all the packets flowing for a TCP connection as a connection gets established, right, and, and, and data starts flowing through there. And through that, right, we can uh, be able to determine by, by inspecting that traffic what network security protocol is being used, uh, some of the key attributes, right, uh, and so forth. Now, the other thing is that in order to get a really comprehensive view of all those network security attributes and to cover additional use cases, we also allow the cryptographic protocol providers. And there, what we're really talking about is all the various technologies that get used to implement these protocols. So things like system SSL or open SSH, or from a TCP IP perspective, our IPsec support. So there's also new interfaces that allow these cryptographic protocol providers to push this information down to TCP IP so that we can associate it with TCP connections and enterprise extender and, and um, um, make those attributes available. The way that we're looking to make that available is through new SMF 119 records. There's a new subtype, subtype 11, uh, that has, as we'll see here, uh, uh, comprehensive information about network security attributes, network encryption security attributes. So that data is available through standard SMF and is also available through our real-time network management interface service. There's a new service called uh, SysTCPER that basically is created that will allow any network management products to also be able to obtain this information in real-time. Okay, so a little bit about SMF records. We're not going to uh, spend a lot of time in going through all the details on this, but I do want to give you a high level of the information that, that will be available. So um, with the subtype uh, 11 record, right, this is a new subtype that we're introducing. And what you'll see there on the right-hand side is basically a high-level view, right, of what the, the information in that record um, uh, is. So we start with our standard SMF header that every SMF record has. And then if you're familiar with our 119 records, they all typically have a standard TCP IP identification section. So there you get to find things like, you know, which TCP IP stack, a Sysplex name, and, and things of that nature. The real interesting information is in the blue. So there, we'll have a, uh, for this uh, new subtype, we'll have a, a ZERT common um, uh, connection common section. And that, in, that section basically includes key information about the session and the connection. So for TCP connection, what are the local and remote IP addresses and ports, right? Things of that nature. Uh, what protocols are being used? byte counts, how much data uh, went across that connection. And this also includes, as, as we mentioned before, Enterprise Extender, right? We would have the notion of a connection there as well. Uh, following that information, so that tells you attributes of the connection is uh, the network encryption uh, attributes 
depending on the type of network security protocol that's being used. So there's a section for IP um, uh, filtering and IPsec that kind of go together. So there I should clarify. Um, if you're using IP filters uh, in general, right, to basically uh, uh, determine uh, uh, what traffic is allowed to enter and leave your host, uh, we will include information about those IP filter rules, right, that basically uh, may be in effect for that connection. If you're using TLS, and TLS and SSL are synonymous in, in this section here, we will have a section that gives you those protection uh, attributes. If you're using SSH, again, you may have uh, another se uh, session there to represent that. And finally, if you're using IPsec, right, for these connections, there will be uh, uh, a section there to, to give you some of those key attributes. And then finally, uh, you may have some optional sections uh, for an optional section for distinguished name section. So this is basically, uh, we would, if certificates are being used for uh, uh, the security session, uh, both from either endpoint, we will uh, also be able to capture there some information about the subject and issue or distinguished uh, names. Uh, from those certificates. Now, uh, how often would you see these records? So there would be a record typically created when a connection starts. So that would be event type 1. So um, uh, that would include information about the state of the connection when it first started, right? Uh, there would also be a connection termination record when that connection terminated, event type 3. Now, one of the key things there is that uh, during a session, there could be this doesn't happen necessarily often, a protection state change. Let's say a connection was being covered by TLS and then TLS was terminated so midway through that uh, TCP connection and data started flowing in the clear or other, other major uh, changes in the security characteristics of that session. So optionally, you know, uh, uh, if needed, you would get a protection state uh, change event as well that would describe the key changes that occurred. Now, you'll see at the bottom, we also have this event type four for short connection termination record. So the thought here is around optimizing for cases where you may have very high volume or very short-lived TCP connections. So if you have connections that establish a connection, do an SSL handshake, send a request in, get a response back from ZOS, and then terminate that connection and do that over and over again. So think about hundreds per second type of rate. We want to optimize how much data we generate. So for very short-lived connections, rather than having a connection initiation and termination record, we will produce automatically what's called a short connection termination record that basically includes all the information you need to reflect that connection. It will tell you when it started, when it ended, what the security attributes were, but we're cutting down the volume of records by a factor of 50% there. Uh, ZERT is an optional function that is enabled and disabled, and we won't go through uh, all the externals of how one does that, but anytime that occurs where somebody enables the technology or disables it, we'll also create SMF records to reflect that. Okay, so in terms of what's collected at a high level, it's attributes of the connection and its security sessions, significant attributes like the protocol version, crypto uh, algorithms and key lengths, uh, and any change in these types of um, uh, attributes will generate that state change record that we talked about. Other attributes are included for informational purposes, like protocol session identifiers or certificate expiry data or certificate serial numbers. That's primarily for informational purposes only. If that, if that information changes, we will not trigger a state change record. Key thing here is that ZERT does not collect or store or record any values of secret keys, initialization vectors, or any other secret values that are negotiated as part of the cryptographic protocol handshake, right? So we will not provide you with secret keys, right, that somebody can use to decrypt the data. That's very sensitive information, right, and beyond the scope of what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, the next few charts I'm not going to cover in detail, uh, but uh, I just quickly just want to give you the view uh, in a little bit more uh, visible format of what we talked about before. The standard SMF header, the TCP IP identification sec uh, section, very similar to the SMF records you have today. 
the Zerk Connection comment section, you always will get one of these, right? And this is where you'll see things like local and remote IP addresses, what protocol was being used, whether this is IPv4, IPv6, information that identifies the application on the host, things like job name, job ID, things of that nature, inbound and outbound uh, byte counts, user ID associated with a socket owner, uh, when the connection was established, when the connection was terminated, depending on the record. Now, for uh, other sections, as we mentioned, IP filtering, if that's an effect, will include things like the IP filter rule names for inbound and outbound. IPsec, if that's being used, right, you'll get uh, detailed information about Ike, the Ike tunnel that's being used, and also about the IPsec tunnel information. And you see a lot of uh, interesting attributes in there, right, that uh, typically play a role in determining compliance. Also, for certificate, as we mentioned before, right, there's additional information there for local and remote uh, certificate that we can uh, also include there. Now, note here when we, uh, you'll see in these sections, they have uh, some of them say zero or one. These will only be there if you're using IPsec, and IPsec is in effect for the TCP connection identified in the previous section, had a bearing on it, right? Quickly moving on to TLS and SSH. These also are optional sections that will appear, right, if the TCP connection was being covered by those protocols. And for each one of those, you'll see similar information about network security attribute and similar information about certificate information if that was available. In addition, for TLS and SSH, we also will include distinguished names from the relevant certificates, right, if those uh, were available. Now, a key thing here with the zero and ones is a natural question is, for a given TCP connection, do you only get one of these, right? Do I just get an IPsec one, uh, IP filters, or a TLS one? And the answer is, typically, you might see just one, whichever one is relevant. But there are cases where you could be using TLS and also using IPsec and going through double encryption, in which case you may see multiple sections, right? And that might be interesting information to know and understand on its own, right, on whether that's really necessary, as obviously in your environment that may be causing uh, additional processing. Okay, so uh, just to summarize, what this function is really geared uh, for is addressing this need, right, this growing need of being able to identify uh, and enumerate the cryptographic protection attributes of all your network traffic right on on ZOS and we say all but we're really focusing on as we said is TCP and enterprise extender which we think is again covers you know the vast majority of your network traffic inside and um, uh, in and out of ZOS now uh, the key thing to mention here is that this traffic this information is very useful when ZOS is the server right which is the typical role and clients are connecting in but this information is also critical when ZOS applications and middleware are acting as clients connecting outbound, right, to other ZOS or distributed platforms, right? So uh, we're looking to cover both of those use cases. So here, where this is really geared towards the network, ZOS network administrator, right, to be able to get this comprehensive view by activating collection of new SMF records and analyzing those new SMF records. We, we covered here the uh, new SMF uh, 119 subtype 11 records, right, that can be created and captured both to SMF or used by the real-time NMI or both, right? It's really your choice about uh, what you enable and what the use cases are. Now, this is the, the first phase of a function that we, we would expect over time will evolve. Uh, but basically, this first phase gives you all this comprehensive data, right, in a single place to be able to analyze what your network encryption uh, state, state is for your ZOS systems. And, uh, I'm going to now turn this over to uh, uh, Sam Reynolds, who's going to walk us through the uh, remaining content, starting with uh, an update on ZOS mail. Okay, thank you, guys. So, as Gus said, um I'm going to start off uh, my portion of the presentation with uh, mail and what we've done to that in V2R3. And this is sort of a story that goes back several years. Um, we, for a long time, have had three mail programs on ZOS with communication server, SMTPD, SendMail, and CSSMTP. 
And a little over three years ago, we did our first statement of direction where we said that we were going to converge everything on CSSMTP and eliminate the other two programs in a future release. Uh, and you see that uh, statement of direction or a follow up statement of direction here. Uh, we updated the SOD to produce the one you see here in July of 2015. That would have been with the availability announcement for V2R2. And at that point in time, we became more specific and said that V2R2 would be the last release to include SendMail and to include SMTPD. And you would need to determine how to go forward from that. Um, so where we are is in this next chart, we see the mail components as they exist in the currently available release, V2R2, and the previous ones. And there are three uh, mail programs represented by those yellow boxes you see there. CSSMTP, which is an SMTP client that we ship in V1R11. It's been around quite a while now. And then the two older programs, SMTPD and SendMail, which are both have, have both client and server functionality. And those are the two that we'll be removing. So if we look at the changes in 2.3, you see all these X's here for the things that are going away. Uh, SMTPD, send mail, and the communication paths to them for the most part, with one exception we'll see related to how send mail commands are processed. So it leaves us with the picture you see on the next chart here, where we now have the one major program, CSSMTP, which is an SMTP client, and we also have this thing down below called the send mail to Z CSSMTP bridge. And we'll be talking about that in some detail in subsequent charts. But that's going to allow us to continue to have some um, functionality as far as processing send mail commands. But the key thing here, and we'll, we'll emphasize this on another chart as well, is that CSSMTP is a very modern SMTP client, but it is just a client. There is no mail server functionality on ZOS in V2R3, so no ability to receive mail on the platform. Uh, so our next chart, why are we doing this? Well, it's very difficult to support three mail programs, three completely independent mail programs, two of which are very old. The SMTPD NJE Gateway is a application built on the Pascal API. We've not done any development around the Pascal API in many, many years. It's very an antiquated. Um, SMTPD is uh, supports older SMTP RFCs and quite frankly is somewhat loose in its support for those to begin with. It does not support modern standards uh, such as uh, TLS and IPv6. It is a single threaded daemon which means uh, that it sometimes has performance issues. SendMail is also equally old. We, like, we ported it to the platform in 2001, so 16 years ago, and there, it has just not been uh, maintained with current standards since then. CSSMTP, on the other hand, was introduced in ZOS v1 or 11, and right out of the gate we said this will be our strategic direction for mail. All development and support efforts have been focused on CSSMTP since then and will continue to be going forward. We have done many enhancements to CSSMTP since we shipped it. You will see that there are additional ones in V2R3, and we certainly have many RFEs out there for additional enhancements that we'll be, we'll be considering in future releases. Um, but the point is that will be the direction for mail from ZOS communication service perspective. Uh, already at the standpoint of where it is right now, it provides superior performance, function, it's much more current with standards, and so forth. Now the last bullet uh, on here, there's a more detail in the appendix, but I want to direct your attention to this. We, we did a survey um, of our customers about three years ago where we asked them what mail programs they were using at that point in time, and then a little over a third had migrated to CSSMTP already. So hopefully that uh, migration is much further along now. But we went back to some of the customers that had completed a migration and we said, what was your issues? Was, was it easy? Was it difficult? And if you had an issue, what, what was the number one problem? And the biggest point of feedback we got was that it was difficult to verify production mail workloads. It's, it's one thing to put up CSSMTP in a test environment and say, yeah, this seems to work, but I don't have my full production mail workloads in my test environment, and I won't know until I go live in production if there's a problem. So we provided a CSMTP test mode capability along with the utility program called EasyBM Copy that allows you to run CSSMTP on your production systems, processing your production mail workloads, in a test situation where the actual mail flow continues to go out through SMTPD, there's no disruption, even if there's a problem with how CSSMTP <coughs> processes your mail. 
So this is a great way to um, test your CSMTP migration if you're at that point now. The test mode capability and EasyBM copy were provided uh, in V2R2, and that was APARed back at that time to V2R1. Uh, so this has been available for quite some time and something I would encourage you to look into if you've not ma made your migration yet. And as I say here, in the appendix, there's a whole section on this that talks about how those functions work and how you would use them. So, in ZOS V2R3, SMTPD, and SendMail have been removed. You cannot configure or start the daemons in 2.3. And as I said before, the important thing to consider is there's no replacement function for the receipt of email on the platform. We, again, through surveys and many, much, much customer contact over the years, have determined that most of our customers don't do a significant amount of inbound email processing on the platform. Most email processing tends to be handled on other platforms. Uh, mail on ZOS tends to be generated by batch jobs in the forms of reports and things like that, which is typically all outbound. So hopefully this is not going to be too big of an issue for our customer base. SendMail is kind of an interesting uh, thing because while there probably are a few people that sit at a Unix shell and issue SendMail commands manually, we believe the lion's share of SendMail usage is from applications that issue SendMail commands as part of their operations. We did not want you to have to ferret out all those applications and their SendMail issuances and update those to, to some other uh, type of request. So in 2.3, we provide a bridge that takes the SendMail commands issued by those applications, or by a Unix shell user for that matter, and translates them into something CSSMTP can process. And let's look at, go to the next chart to talk about what that means. So as it says up here at the top, we're going to allow the processing of many existing SendMail command variations using this bridge. It's going to take a SendMail command, parse the input options that are associated with the command, read the mail message that it talks about, add SMTP commands and headers if needed, and then it takes what results from that and puts it on the JES spool so that CSSMTP can read it just like any other email that CSSMTP processes and ultimately send it outbound to a target mail server. So um, you're using CSSMTP for the actual transport and we have this bridge that sits between your send mail commands and CSSMTP to translate it into something CSSMTP can deal with. So now, as a V2R3, the send mail command is actually a symbolic link to the bridge uh, so that your existing applications don't get touched. They issued send mail in 2.2, they issue a send mail command in 2.3, but the bridge handles it instead of the real send mail program in V2R3. So the next chart, um, chart 24, shows this pictorially. We see a send mail command at the top left of this chart send mail dash T, and then we're, we're uh, directing in a, a, an email message, uh, the bridge takes the message and wraps around it the SCT, SMTP commands and headers that are necessary, puts it on the JES spool, CSSMTP picks that up, and then sends it outbound to an external mail transfer agent, uh, the target server that it's, he's communicating with. You can directly invoke the, this executable that we're providing that we call the bridge, um, with the name EZAT mail. It's just an executable program and that's the name and it's the same syntax is uh, associated with the send mail command itself. We don't see many people doing this other than strictly during early early testing of trying to see what the bridge is going to do for them but you can do this so I include it here for completeness. Normally the bridge will be processing send mail commands and so here's the form, existing format of a send mail command. No change here. Send mail, some sort of command switches, recipient names, maybe you don't have to put them there, they can be in the mail file. Either way, in some sort of mail message. The result of all this is we add the header commands and headers and put it on the JS pool data set. Send mail today in V2R2 and before can be in, invoked from <coughs> OMVS shell or through batch and so the send mail bridge can be invoked the same way. If you go to the appendix there's another section in there that talks about the send mail bridge with some tables that go through and say well, what are the supported configuration statements, the command line switches, the options, all that type of stuff is in there. The gist of it is if you're using send mail today and you have a send mail configuration file that configuration file will, will work in V2R3 we may be ignoring some of the options in it, but uh, it, we will still be able to process it. Now, very important is that we also make 
that bridge available or we're going to make it available on B2R1 and B2R2 with that APAR number you see on this chart. And the reason there is we don't want you to apply to B2R3 and if you've been using SendMail, immediately have to start using the bridge without any transition period. So sometime between now and your plans to migrate to V2R3, if you use SendMail today, it would be a good idea to get this APAR, put it on, and try out the bridge. Again, you can invoke the bridge with EZAT mail. That's a great first step uh, for some initial testing. SendMail is still there. This APAR does not affect SendMail in any way whatsoever out of the box. You don't get that happening until V2R3. However, we give you instructions with the APAR on how to create a symbolic link so that your SendMail commands invoke EZAT mail, the bridge, instead of the real SendMail program. And so as you do your initial testing, eventually you'll probably want to transition to that uh, to do further testing. And of course, you can switch that link uh, back and forth to, between the bridge and the real SendMail program as you need to. <coughs> this APAR is in um, PTF test right now. Uh, it is our uh, intention to try to provide it by the end of next month, the end of April. That could end up being in the, during the month of May, but this will be available pretty soon either way. Okay, and so that's the end of the discussion about the bridge. Um, the next thing to talk about are some CSSMTP compatibility enhancements. So again, three years ago, over a third of our customers had gone to CSSMTP. M many more have gone over the last two or three years. And along the way, they have had feedback about certain functions that they believe were inhibitors to their migration. And those result in RFEs, and we address those where we can. In this section, we'll talk about three of the things we did to improve compatibility um, for CSSMTP in environments where SMTPD had previously been used. And the first one we're going to look at is improved TLS compatibility with mail servers. So everything today, most people want to ensure all communications they have. And one of the advantages I mentioned earlier was that CSSMTP works with TLS unlike the older <coughs> SMTPD program. So um, TLS security setup between CSSMTP and a target server is defined by RFC 3207. Now you can tell by that RFC number that's a fairly old RFC. And we implemented our support for that. We noted that the RSC talked about a second eHello uh, and capabilities exchange after the TL TLS negotiation that the RFC designated as optional. Since it was optional, CSSMTP did not implement that second eHello in negotiation. So um, that, it turns out, has caused problems with occasion occasionally with other servers that expect and insist upon receiving that second eHello. So in V2R3, we provide a configuration option to enable CSSMTP to do the second eHello and capabilities exchange. The, the classic case of this, and one, one I'll particularly direct your attention to, is uh, Microsoft Exchange Server. They do require the second eHello. So if you want a TLS secure traffic between CSSMTP and Microsoft Exchange, you need this capability. There's an option uh, statement in the configuration file, TLS eHello, yes or no, that you set to yes if you want us to do the second eHello command. By default, it's no. We knew we would be shipping this via APAR, so we took the um, conservative approach of setting it to no. The support is going to be provided via APAR on 2.1 and 2.2. It actually has been made available for some time now. Uh, there's another APAR note number I note on this chart, the very bottom, it's additional recommended maintenance for, for this, and that APAR is not available, but I suspect will ship within the next week or two. But, the, but this function, it's a 2-3 function, but it is available in 2-1 and 2-2 um, with, again, the additional maintenance I note. Next chart, just very quickly, is a CSSMTP display config, which shows the options and such, and it just shows the new one in this case. We're highlighting the TLS eHello. In this case, it's set to no, which is the default. Okay, the second um, enhancement we'll look at in this, pay, in this section is related to code page processing. And it's a little bit difficult to talk to and probably is not of interest to most people on this call because many of you are in the U.S. where code page issues aren't as common as they are in some other geographies. <coughs> SMTPD, this is another one of the many limitations of SMTPD, is it had very limited code page support. Um, um, email, according to the RFCs, it flows on the wire flows uh, is, is ASCII data. 
Uh, of course, we're in an environment where EBCDIC data is used. So we would, we would use 1047 for the EBCDIC to ASCII conversion. Uh, SMTPD had no knowledge of any other code pages, and in particular, IBM 273 is one that's very commonly used in Europe. So a number of customers discovered a problem with one particular character, a very important character in email, the at sign. And if you look at this little table, it kind of explains the problem. In the IBM 1047 code page, the symbol that's at 7 Charlie code point is what we think of as the at symbol, that A looking thing. But that, it, that same code point in IBM 273, this European code page, is that thing that looks like a funny S. I think it's called the section symbol. And if you look at uh, the symbol that is code point B5, those are exactly swapped. So as customers discovered this, that we're talking about well over a decade ago, um, the ones that needed 273 set, decided they would uh, implement a workaround. The workaround was to find the programs that generated um, email and, and change all the email addresses, not to use the normal at sign, but to use the one that was at the correct code, code point. In other words, that section symbol. So instead of having emails going out like name at domain dot whatever, it would be name section symbol. And what that meant is that when C SMTPD would process it, it would see that symbol that would say, oh, that's a point seven Charlie. That's the at sign. And the at sign would actually hit the wire, which is, of course, what you wanted to happen. So it was a nice little workaround for the fact that SMTPD had such a limited uh, support for code pages. Well, here comes CSSMTP in uh, V1R11. It has complete code page support. It can handle any code page that Icon V um, supports, and that's quite a large number of code pages, and you can actually code your own if uh, Icon V doesn't support it out of the box. So we did not want our customers to have to go searching through all of their email generation utilities and go and undo this uh, workaround they had and put in place to deal with SMTPT's limited support. So VTR3 implements an at sign character that is used um, to allow you to tell us what at sign character your mail generation programs have used. So if you had hacked your routines to use the section symbol instead of the at sign symbol, you would code in the options at sign in that section symbol so that CSSMTP would know to search, through, search for that and replace it with the real at symbol. And this way you can, can go forward without having to change any of the uh, programs you have that are generating email. So here's the option statement, at sign, and you just put whatever symbol you were using previously and, or can continue to use for the at sign symbol. By default, of course, it's the lowercase a looking thing that we use for uh, email addresses. This is, um, was also provided via APAR. Again, it's 2.3 code, but it was provided on 2.1 and 2.2, and that shipped, I think, almost exactly a year ago. So that's actually been out there quite a while. And the next chart shows us the uh, config display output so we can see what that is. And on the config output, we actually show it the hex value as opposed to the actual symbol itself. And the third and final enhancement to CSSMTP we're going to talk about is also code page related. Uh, and it's, again, a problem with a particular symbol. And um, in this case, CSSMTP, as it was originally defined for, for all these years now, since 111, has a translate configuration statement that specifies what the code page is being used for the JS spool files. Now, when CSSMTP pulls in the mail, it's got a process that commands and headers. So it has to translate from that code page, whatever translate specifies, to IBM 1047 EBCDIC for processing. Um, for CSMTP to read and, and do what it needs to with the headers. Then it translates to ASCII before sending it to the target, target server. As I said, it all has to go on the wire as ASCII. But it translates it by default to ISO 8859-1, that ASCII code page. And that is the only option as far as how it does the translation to get it on the wire. The body of the mail is translated directly from whatever the code page is that's specified by the translate statement to 8859-1 ASCII. Same as, same as what happens to the headers after they're processed. And there's no option to configure a different ASCII code page. Well, a big problem there is that the euro sign, something clearly very important to those of you in Europe, is not included in the ISO 8859-1 code page. So in V2R3, we add a new configuration parameter, care set, which allows you to specify which ASCII code page you want to use when translating your mail message for, for um, 
sending to the target server. So the mail message body is translated directly from whatever the translate code page was to whatever you put with care set. Um, the mail message is still translated from the translate code page to 1047 for CSSMTP to, to process. I'm, I mean the mail message headers are translated directly to 1047. Uh, and then after that point they're translated to the care set code page um, to go out on the wire. So this gives us now the capability of handling Euro signs properly. So how do you do that uh, in the configuration file on the target server definition? The care set option says this is where you specify which ASCII code page you want to use. Notice this is not on the option statement, it is on the target server statement, which means you could have a different co ASCII code page for a different target server you might be communicating with. Since if that's possible, you're communicating one out of a ge geography, which would use 8859. In the example here, I'm using 1252, which is a very common ASCII code page in Europe, which does have um, support for several symbols that are not included in 8859, such as the euro sign. The support for this will also be rolled back. Again, it's 2-3. It'll be rolled back to 2-1 and 2-2 via the APAR number you see there. And I anticipate that APAR will ship sometime in the next couple of months, sometime in April or May. And this last chart of the middle section just shows, again, the display output, showing all the options. And on the target server de definition, you can see the new CareSat option. And here it's defaulting to the 8859-1 ASCII page. So we'll continue. We have a number of other functions to talk about with mb 2 r 3 The first of the ones we're going to look at is wildcard support for job names on port and port range statements. It's probably most everyone on this call is aware of. But you, you have port to port range statements you can use to configure uh, which users um, can bind or listen to a particular port. Port statement uh, would be used for a single port or port range for a set of ports. And you code the job name parameter to say which jobs are authorized to bind or listen on that port. Uh, in V2R2 and previous releases, there was limited wildcard capability in that you could uh, specify an asterisk for the job name, which meant any job name could uh, bind or listen to that port. Or you could specify an asterisk after a set of characters is an ending wildcard. So ABC asterisk, meaning any job name that starts with ABC, could bind or listen to that port. But customers have told us they needed a, something more flexible to keep from having to code lots of different port or port range statements. So in V2R3, we give you the capability to have asterisks in any position within the job name and also have question marks in the job name. So a question mark will represent a single unspecified character, an asterisk represents zero or more. And that can now be not just at the end, but anywhere within the job name specification on the port or port range statement. Now, what can happen in these situations, of course, is that you could have a job name come in that matches more than one job name specification by the way wildcards work. So what are the rules for choosing in that case? And those rules are laid out on the bottom of this chart here. Uh, we basically use a very simple philosophy of scanning from the left to right, and whenever we um, get a, a, a match, we stop. And, uh, of course, specific character matches are best. The next best match is a specific character versus a single question mark and that with the asterisk coming in last place. And the best way to look at that is to look at a, an example or two. So in this chart, we have a couple of port statements with uh, different um, wild-carded job name specifications on them. A job with na name comes in user 15. Which um, port statement would be selected in this case? Well, we see that, of course, U matches and the S matches both of them. In the next position, the E will match a question or an asterisk, but the question mark is considered more specific. So port 6001 would be selected because that's the better match. In the second example, the same job name, user 15, comes in, but we have a little bit different wildcard specification this time. So the U matches, then the S would match the S or the question mark, but the S is more specific, so port 6002 would be chosen. So it's a very simplistic philosophy because it always works one character at a time from left to right until we can, can break the tie. And so fairly straightforward. Okay, the next um, section is on ATTLS currency with System SSL. And application transparent TLS has been around a long time. I won't spend a lot of time on this chart. You've probably seen it dozens of times, seen it on many CAP education calls as far as what application transparent TLS is. ATTLS shipped in B1R7. It's been around a long time. Uh, 
about three years ago, that same customer survey I referenced earlier, we asked our customers who were using it. Um, over half of them were using it, and three quarters of them were, were either using it or plan to use it. And that was three years ago. That's probably a much greater adoption today. Uh, but basically, ATTLS is a wrapper around system SSL, and it's a way for your applications to get the benefit of TLS protection without coding to the system SSL APIs. So an application can sit there fat, dumb, and happy and do the, the same uh, data transfers it does today, and you go in using configuration assist and configure ATTLS policies that say which applications you want to protect at what level of security, at what time of day. There's all kinds of options that you can configure here. That's what ATTLS is all about, and again, it's um, been a very popular function. It's great, we believe, for our customers, and many customers express a great deal of satisfaction with it. For us, it carries a bit of a tax that, in that every release, we generally have to do some work to keep it in step with system SSL. Obviously, security standards are constantly evolving, and as system SSL does things to stay current with, said, with standards, there's always a ex very, very strong chance that we will have to do things to keep ATTLS in step with system SSL. We typically, if, if they make a change or add an option, we have to externalize that option uh, through policy definitions and through configuration assistant panels. And we, we may have to make updates to Netstat or PA search commands. We may have to update our formatters. We may have to update NMIs or IOCTLs or SMF records. So all of these things have to happen as system SSL goes forward. So if you went back through the release presentations we've done over the years, almost every one since B1R7 has had an, uh, an item in it about ATTLS currency. VTR3 is no different. So this next chart has a list of things that uh, System SSL is doing in VTR3 that require some changes from our part from an ATTLS currency perspective. And again, typically those changes are going to be related to uh, configuration parameters and our policy definitions and through configurate configuration assistant panels. Now we could spend a, a good half hour or so on this single chart talking about what all these do in some detail. So I'm just going to hit some highlights here. Uh, clearly you look down every one of these bullets has a security standard or some RFC numbers. So that's what this is about is staying current with standards. SSL is doing that, system SSL is doing that, so we are doing with ATTLS. Uh, the first one talks about 5th 140-2 security levels and enforcing different cryptographic strengths. So the idea here is we want to enforce minimum cryptographic key strengths, uh, which before might have been at the 80-bit level now and now support up to 112 bits or even higher. And it provides certain internal uh, FIPS mode levels which say what level of a cryptographic key strength are we going to require. So level one, which is equivalent to the current own status, for instance, only requires 80-bit uh, cryptographic key strength. Level two requires 80-bit for or requires 112-bit for some operations, but allows 80-bit for 80-bit for other types of operations. And the highest level, level three, says everything has to be 112-bit strength or higher. An, a, one that's kind of fun to talk to, jump down to the third one for a minute. Uh, V2R2 introduced uh, something called Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. And OCSP is a, a bit new, and it's continuing to evolve. And you see in, um, on that bullet four different RFCs that have um, mandated changes to OCSP. And System SSL's uh, implemented those, and we're externalizing those. And one of them that's kind of interesting is this thing called OCSP stapling. And the idea behind um, stapling, well, let's back up a minute. Let's talk about OCSP in general. With OCSP, instead of working with a, a long certificate revocation list, the idea is that a client would go to an OSP server and say, here's a certificate. Just tell me if it's good or bad. I don't want to look at a whole list. Just tell me about the certificate. And, of course, the OCSP server would say, yes, I can validate that certificate for you. And then the client can connect to the server that owns the certificate. Um, well, imagine a case where a lot of clients are trying to connect to the same site, and so, therefore, they need to all validate the same certificate. So they could really pound the OCSP server with the same request over and over again just from different clients. OCSP stapling says, what if instead the certificate holder, the site that actually owns the certificate, went to the OCSP server and said, give me a, a validation, validate the certificate, I'm going to keep it, and I'm going to periodically refresh it, go back to the server, and now when a client connects in, I'm going to staple that response onto the TLS negotiation so that the client says, oh, this is, a, this is a validated certificate, I don't need to go to the OCSP server myself. 
so this is kind of a performance or an efficiency improvement um, for cases where many clients might be trying to val validate the same certificate. Um, and then lastly, just to look at the bottom one on here, signaling cipher suite value, SCSV, this is, talks, is talked about in RFC 7507, and it provides protection against something called a protocol downgrade attack. And it allows a server to detect when there's an inappropriate fallback to a low, lower security level. So consider a case where a client is connecting and he says, I want to connect with TLS 1.2 or something like that. A server certainly optionally during the negotiation can say, I want, I want to use a lower security level. Well, some clients, if that happens, will disconnect and, and try to reconnect at the lower security level. So this would be a, a way that a, uh, someone could do a man-in-the-middle attack, try to uh, simulate a negotiation to a lower security level and then take advantage of that when the client reconnects at that lower level. The SCSV is, is a value that can be put upon the negotiation by the client where he says, you told me I needed to drop down to this lower security level. When the server sees that SCSV, he looks at that and says, why would I have told you that? I support the higher level. And he immediately knows that something funny is going on and he will deny the connection. So that's an, an inappropriate fallback to a lower level and the SCSV helps the server to detect that. Okay, and so the last section is just a, a whole bunch of um, miscellaneous V2R3 topics. Uh, the first of which is support for enhanced system symbols. ZOS V2R2 was the release that added support for enhanced system symbols. You may remember that uh, from when 2.2 was announced. Uh, what um, that gave you was the ability to have longer system symbol names, up to eight, 16 characters, and longer substitution values. It also gave you the capability to add um, underscores into your symbol, system symbol names if you wish. However, ComServer got the word on that a little bit late and we were not able to include that support in 2.2. So V2R3 finally does add full support for, from ComServer for enhanced system symbols. We now allow up to 16 character symbol names, longer symbol substitution values, and underscore characters. Um, the next couple of charts are kind of difficult to talk to and probably will not affect many of you, but we, we do need to spend a minute or two on the, the use case here. Uh, Get Adder Info is an API that is used to resolve host names to IP addresses. It's been around for 15 years. It was provided in V1R4 when we first enabled the uh, TCP IP stack for IPv6 support. It's a very flexible API. It's got a lot of options so that you can customize the results you want back. You can request that you only want to see IPv4 addresses, only IPv6, or both. It's, it's a really nice API. But again, we did this, we designed this 15 years ago. And at that time, we were using a late level draft of RFC 2553. Well, sometime in the interim, that RFC went obsolete, and 3493 replaced it. Uh, it turns out that for the most part, it didn't affect us. We were still pretty compliant with standards, but there was one use case that was a little bit of a problem. And if you go to the next chart, you see on the first set of sub-bullets at the top there what that use case is. So if you're specifying an address family of unspecified, if you have the AI all flag on, if you're on a system where IPv6 is enabled, and if the host name you're trying to resolve does have IPv6 addresses associated with it, it's that very particular set of circumstances where you'll see a bit of a behavior change in V2R3. Prior to 2.3, that set of circumstances would have resulted in only IPv6 addresses being returned on the resolver call to get our info. Uh, but getting with V2R3, we return all IPv4 and IPv6 addresses that are associated with the host name. This most likely will affect almost none of you. First of all, for it to be of an issue, you do need to be on an IPv6 enabled system. And most domestically, and at least in the US, the, the, those systems are somewhat rare. Furthermore, if you've implemented your, your IPv6 environment according to the recommendations we have in the IPv6 network and application design guide, you'll also be immune from any impact from this. So it's just something to be aware of, but shouldn't impact many people. Sysplex Wide Security Association is something else that's been around for quite a while, for probably a good 15 years. It's the marriage of two technologies, IPsec, with Sysplex Distribution Technology. And so the idea here is the Sysplex Distributor negotiates Security Association with clients using the Internet Key Exchange Protocol, IKE, and then it passes those security associations that have been negotiated to the target stacks. So the target stacks can uh, decrypt and encrypt 
the uh, data no matter which target stacks this, the uh, connection ends up getting sent to. Uh, and of course with VIPA take, take over and um, give back, workloads can move between stacks and this enables the security association to also move and for the encryption decryption, decryption operations to continue. So how is that done? Well those security association Security associations are maintained in a coupling facility structure known as EZB DVIPA. And it is made in a format known as a list format. In 2.2 and earlier, the number of available lists was limited to 2,048. We don't think that's really impacted many customers yet, but that has what's the limit has been. Well, if you remember our release overviews about V2R2, ZOS V2R2 from a communication perspective was a very big scalability release. We did a lot of things uh, in 2.2 to enable and improve scalability. Obviously that was a 64-bit enablement release, but a couple of other key things we did is we increased the maximum number of dynamic VIPAs you could have from 1,024 to 4,096. We restructured the Ike daemon so it went from a single threaded environment to a, an environment with, cert, with pools of threads that we could split workload between and that it resulted in a tremendous improvement in um, security association activation throughput, like I think around 7x was one of our measurements. So what we see here is a much more scalable situation with um, IPsec, and we also see more customers moving in that direction because of increasing security demands. That makes us concerned that maybe 2048 list is not enough going forward. So 2.3 adds a new VTAM start option called DV list count, it specifies the number of lists the EGD VIPA structure can have. By default, it's going to be one of four discrete values, by the way. It's not just any value. It could be 2048, that's the default because that's the value that it had in, two, in V2R2 and before, or these other three values you see, essentially 4K, 8K, and 16K. A key thing is that all values within the SysPlex should specify the same value. And of course, a consequence of that is since you can't change the value of the number of lists on anything prior to 2.3, it means all systems must be at V2R3 to really utilize this new um, start option. It's modifiable with VTAM ops, and you're probably looking at this and saying, well, how would I ever know if I need to make it bigger, and if so, which of these four values? The CF Sizer tool is updated to help provide guidance for that. Okay, we'll just very quickly hit the next section. This is mostly a recap, but uh, this table you see shows the, all the TCP IP device drivers that existed in V2R1. Uh, theoretically, one of those didn't. SMCD at the top was not provided until uh, V2R2, but the rest were all around in 2.1. In V2R2, a number of those were removed. We did, went through an SOD process, warned you this was coming. I don't think anybody has felt much of an impact over this, but those were all gone as of 2.2 shipment. We then issued another statement of direction with the availability announcement for 2.2 that said we were getting rid of a few more that we don't think are getting much use from our customer set. And we see that on this table. Uh, in 2.3, those last three at the bottom there will be gone as well. So really, from 2.1 to 2.3, we basically cut the number of device drivers, TCP IP support, in basically half. Something else that we sod the removal of was the trivial file transfer protocol daemon. Uh, and TFTPD has been removed in 2.3. Um, it's not something we believe many people at all use. It's not possible to secure it, so we don't recommend using it. And in 2.3, it will be gone. Config Assistant, just a really quick update, a couple of updates here. Um, Config Assistant, you know, it's been around a long time as a tool for the configuration of our network policy-based functions such as IPsec, ATTLS, IDS, policy-based routing, quality of service, all of that stuff. In V2R2, we began a very large, significant effort to provide the capability to also configure the TCP IP stack, to be able to go through and use this, this GUI model to configure a TCP IP scratch instead of just hard coding the member like you've done all these years. That's a very ambitious undertaking. And in V2R2, we did, at GA time, provide the capability to use the panels to create a TCP IP stack from scratch. But we also acknowledge that to be really useful, there need to be three aspects to this. You need to be able to configure a stack from scratch. You need to be able to import an existing TCP IP profile from your data sets uh, that you were going to use as a starting point. And if you have a TCP IP profile defined that you like, you need to be able to go in and make a, a few changes 
uh, and generate a change set, the, the actual very obey member that you would use to put those changes into um, make them active. So when we shipped to two, we said you have the capability now to from scratch create a TCP IP profile in the config assistant, but we're going to provide a statement of direction to say we understand that you need more. You need to be able to import an existing TCP IP profile. That's the part I bold faced it here here in the SOD. And we fact did realize that portion of the SOD in September. In September, via the APARs you see there, we shipped the ability to import an existing TCP IP profile into Config Assistant. The other bold face part in this chart of the SOD says we also plan enhancements to support making dynamic configuration changes to an active TCP IP configuration. So you've got in Config Assistant what represents your current configuration. You want to go add an interface, change this parameter, whatever the case may be, and generate the uh, change set, the very obey file that you're going to use. We are reiterating here that we continue to plan to do that uh, and ship that capability in V2R3. And one last topic is around, oddly enough, VTAM internal trace. VTAM internal trace is something most of you don't think of uh, very often anymore. Probably, uh, hopefully, most of you have very stable VTAM environments and you probably do not open that many PMRs. And you don't think about VIT even being there until you open a PMR and level 2 says, we need to diagnose your problem, we need a trace. And would you please turn on this set of VIT options? And what you may not know or may forget is that when you turn those on, you're adding VIT options because there are a set that are always running and they're listed here. And um, so as time goes by, with VTAM code being fairly stable and fewer uh, problems coming in related to it, we have, have been getting questions about do we really need to run all of these trace options all the time? Well, we shipped an APAR about last June or so that you see on this page which removed one of the VIT options from the default set. By default, SMS is no longer included in the VIT that is automatically run without you turning it on because we felt like we did not necessarily need that as much anyway. That APAR shipped in, uh, last summer and is available in 2.1 and 2.2 and of course it's base behavior in 2.3. But now in 2.3 and also via the APAR you'll note on this chart, we have another APAR that gives you additional capability uh, which is the ability to completely disable all VIT options. So if you apply this APAR, or when you go to V2R3, you can run with absolutely no VIT options on whatsoever. Very, very important here. Second bullet, that does not change IBM's stance that the minimum required set of VIT options are the one you should run. But we're giving the capability for you to make judgment calls if you would like to turn some or all of them off. But if you disable any of the base set, we do believe that you will impact Level 2's ability to do first failure data capture and diagnose problems without recreates. So that is something to please keep in mind if you look at this. It provide, what it gives you is a startup so called bit control. By default, bit control is base, which means nothing changes from the way it has been. You get that standard set of uh, default bit options. You cannot turn them off with modify trace commands. But if you set bit control to full, then you can do anything you want with modify trace commands as far as enabling and, in, and disabling separate VIT options and possibly even turning them all off. We do have a health check which will warn you if you have uh, disabled any of what we consider the standard option set. Because again, we do believe the standard option set is still highly recommended to enable us to do a diagnosis of problems. And with that, we come to the end of the 2-3 uh, content update.